Welcome back to the second part of the workshop. And it's our great pleasure to have Liam McAllister from Cornell here, who will start the meeting, the second day of the meeting, and talk about combinatorial cosmology. Thank you, Liam. Am I audible? Yes. Thanks, Fabian. And uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's a real privilege to address all of you uh, at this very timely meeting. Uh, this talk was written for those of you who have not worked on string theory. Um, and my goal is to give a high-level overview that will hopefully set the stage for some of the later talks and for our discussions afterward. What I'd like to explain is the structure of one of the core problems in our subject, which is trying to analyze the string landscape. So the talk's about realistic solutions of string theory, and I'll make it clear during the remainder what I mean by realistic. And what I aim to do is to explain why the solutions allowed by cosmological measurements are completely specified by finite lists of integers. We can think of these integers as quantized fundamental parameters. And if we'd like to understand what string theory predicts, we need to connect those integers to observations. So what I'll do is formulate this task of getting from fundamental integer parameters to observables as a computational problem and then eventually as a target for machine learning. So I'll start with a gentle and brief invitation to quantum gravity. I'll explain why parameters are quantized in quantum gravity. I'll define what I mean by the string landscape. And then after those generalities, I'll go into one class of examples of compactifications of string theory on hypersurfaces in toric spaces. This is a particularly useful combinatorial problem that illustrates some of the main problems we face in the landscape. And then I'll close with some targets for machine learning. So, so first, what is quantum gravity? If you take the fundamental constants in nature, three of them, Planck's constant h-bar, the speed of light, and Newton's gravitational constant, you can make quantities that have dimensions of mass, energy, time, and length, the Planck mass, Planck energy, Planck time, Planck length. And quantum gravity is what happens when these are the characteristic scales in a system. Now, you can note that the Planck energy is actually a lot of energy. This is the energy in a tank of gas. And Quantum gravity phenomena are what occur when you put that much energy in one quantum, say in one electron or one photon. When you do that, um, the Compton wavelength of the particle, so the characteristic scale of quantum indeterminacy of the particle, and the Schwarzschild radius, the length scale setting strong gravitational effects, become comparable. Uh, and this ruins most of our abilities to work in the various simplifying approximations that describe quantum mechanics in flat space and classical general relativity. So this is where the conflict comes from. When does it matter? Well, it matters in very extreme conditions, in black hole singularities, conceivably at black hole horizons, uh, in collisions at Planckian energies, in the Big Bang singularity, and in the period of inflation in the early universe. And Given that, you might ask, do we even need to be mindful of quantum gravity if it only matters in the most extreme cases? The answer to that is simply that every time we've tried to study much more extreme circumstances, we've eventually learned more fundamental laws. The subject of a complete talk on its own, something I won't delve into at all, is that quantum gravity turns out to be required to interpret certain observations in cosmology, um, observations of the cosmic microwave background. That's just an aside. It's clearly key to understanding what gravity is. And in fact, it's also the best hope. It's the current frontier for understanding what physical laws are, what kinds of physical laws are possible. And part of the landscape problem I'll be describing consists of asking, in a quantum gravitational theory, what are the possible laws of nature? We'll see that they're discrete. OK, so string theory is a finite theory of quantum gravity. Finite means that uh, the predictions it makes for given scattering processes are always finite. There's no regularization and renormalization of infinities needed, as we sometimes have to do in regular quantum field theories. And in string theory, the fundamental constituents are strings, either closed strings, so loops, or open strings with two endpoints, rather than this whole panoply of particles in the standard model of particle physics. Now, there are a lot of different string theories, type 1, type 2a, type 2b, two different so-called heterotic string theories. These are 10-dimensional theories. There's an 11-dimensional theory called M-theory, which doesn't have strings, but has the parents of strings in it. And then there's a 12-dimensional construction called F-theory. But actually, each of these things is related to the others by an intricate network of exact duality relationships. And by dualities, we mean perfect equivalences. So these theories being dual means that they describe exactly the same physics 
but manifest in different ways, described in different ways. And so up to these dualities, there's really just one kind of, well, for the experts, supersymmetric string. So we're really thinking about one string theory or one grand theory that consists of all of these string theories and M theory and also F theory. And these are different windows on the properties of that theory, different ways of, of looking at what it is. Now, despite there being these different faces of the theory, um, they, they do share some commonalities. One of them is that the string theories described here are naturally 10-dimensional. And so the fundamental solution of these theories is 10-dimensional Minkowski space, pictured here. So here the zero is time, one, two, three, or x, y, z, and then these are six additional spatial coordinates. And what I've drawn is R31, so Minkowski space, times R6. That's the natural, simplest solution of the theory. And compactification is the name we give to studying solutions that are a little bit more involved. They involve, for example, Minkowski space, now times a compact space, rather than a non-compact Euclidean space. This is still a space of signature um, all plus. It's a Riemannian manifold that's compact. Now, a vacuum solution of string theory means a solution in the absence of sources of stress energy, so no matter. Nothing there except the geometry itself. And the Einstein equations in vacuum, even in four dimensions, read the Ricci tensor vanishes. So that's still true in 10 dimensions in, in string theory. The Einstein equations are equivalent to the vanishing of the Ricci tensor. And if I write that out in components, so here are the 0, 1, 2, 3 directions tangent to the Minkowski space, and let's let indices mn run over the six internal directions, then the vanishing of the Ricci tensor means that the four-dimensional Ricci tensor and the six-dimensional Ricci tensor have to vanish. Minkowski space is flat. The Ricci tensor already vanishes here. So all we've got to do is ensure this one. We've got to ensure that the six-dimensional compact space is Ricci flat. And so what this leads us to is the idea that a vacuum solution of string theory corresponds to a compact Ricci flat six manifold. And so much of our work consists of finding manifolds like that. Now, one very striking thing about string theory is that it has no fundamental dimensionless parameters. We'll spend a lot of time talking about the way that parameters show up in the theory. But if you just look at the theory on the string world sheet itself, there are no dials you can adjust. There's one dimensionful parameter, which is the length of a string, or the tension of a string, but that just sets the units for the problem. There is nothing else. And this is quite different from quantum field theories. I mean, you look at any quantum field theory Lagrangian in a textbook, and there are lots of coupling constants and interaction strengths and masses and stuff. There's none of that here. So all the parameters that we see in the low energy world are determined actually by the geometry of the internal space. And the interesting thing about that is that that means that the parameters are determined not by the Lagrangian, but by the solution to the equations that come from that Lagrangian. So uh, all the parameters in nature are set by the expectation values of fields, primarily those that dictate the properties of the internal geometry, like its size and shape. So you can imagine stretching either the overall size of this torus, or you could distort one of the cycles to be pinched smaller, or something like that. Or you could distort the sizes of the cycles in this complicated space. As an example of a field, we might think of a real valued quantity. It takes real values at each point in x, y, z, and t. And it might, for example, represent the volume of the six manifold. More generally, we'll study fields that involve the volumes of cycles in the manifold rather than the whole thing itself. Now, continuously variable parameters, parameters that you can adjust with no energy cost. So imagine you can change the size of this thing without changing the energy. Those things correspond to scalar fields in our four-dimensional theory, scalar fields with zero mass. And the name for a massless scalar field is a modulus. So moduli fields, massless scalar fields, are catastrophic in cosmology. If you have moduli, everything goes wrong. The uh, light elements that are formed in Big Bang nucleosynthesis in the first few minutes can be destroyed by decays of the moduli. The moduli can cause too much dark matter to appear. They can cause the universe to recollapse. And um, perhaps simplest to understand, they can cause fifth forces. So we're very familiar with the massless spin two field, the graviton that mediates gravity. And we know about a massless spin one field, the photon that mediates electromagnetism. These are both long range forces. But we've not seen any evidence for long range forces mediated by massless spin zero fields. So the theory better not predict massless spin zero fields. So 
this is what I meant by realistic solutions. We're not going to actually build the standard model or anything. By realistic, I just mean not ruled out by the, the preceding considerations. Right? So a realistic solution for today just means um, a solution without continuous deformations, without moduli. And these solutions we call isolated vacua, but since we always mean the same thing, we usually just call them vacua. So if I say I found a vacuum of string theory, in this context what I mean is I found a solution of the equations of motion, a Ricci flat six manifold, where the resulting spin zero fields all have masses bigger than some minimum value. That's positive. Now, um, I claim that there are no fundamental parameters in the theory. And we're hereby demanding that there, are no that there are no continuous parameters in the solution. All that leaves are discrete parameters in the solution. And when you've discarded the continuous data describing a geometry, you've modded out by continuously variable things, what's left is topology. So all you have left is the topology of the six manifold. And so what, what this brings us to is that a cosmologically viable solution of string theory is specified by the topological invariance of the internal six manifold. Yes, David. What about the cosmological constant? Do you want to view that as some integer time something? Uh, we'll talk about the cosmological constant in this context in just a minute. Because I was invoking uh, supersymmetric theories, there's no 10 DCC. And so there won't be a 4 DCC, except in as much as it arises from these solutions. So, so um, yeah, we'll have a, we'll have a, a slide about the, uh, how the landscape presents uh, a, a CC. Yeah, good. Other, other questions? Yeah, were you including fluxes in your topological invariance? Uh, next slide. Yes. Thank you. Right. Um, right. So this is, this is uh, the, I should have really said associated to here. And uh, as you know perfectly well, the, the, it is true that they're specified by topological invariance associated to the six manifold. On this slide, heuristically, they count holes and handles in X. But no, really, they involve, first of all, OK, the topology of x, like Hodge numbers of x, the six manifold, its intersection numbers, but also stuff you can put on x. OK, absolutely right. The topology of extended objects with some tension, called d brains, on submanifolds in x. What kind of d brains depends on which kind of string theory you're describing, but you'll always be putting them on submanifolds. You, you need to specify what the wrapping numbers are. So how many times do you wrap them on various cycles? And then what bundles do you put on top of them? You have to specify a vector bundle on top of the d brain. There's a fancier description, which I won't get into, but roughly speaking, this is what you have to do. And then finally, you have to specify the number of units of magnetic fluxes of various kinds threading various cycles. So here I have uh, Maxwell flux threading through a little ring, but you should think of three-form, five-form fluxes, et cetera. Yes, please. Why can't there be other discrete symmetries, like just a Z2 symmetry of your surface or something? Oh, yes. Like you said everything has to be topological, but there are sometimes discrete automorphisms. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So um, there, you can find solutions um, where you, you originally there are moduli. You go to a point in the moduli space, and at that point in moduli space, there are enhanced symmetries. That's correct. So, so, so those can arise. Um, that's an e example of something that I'll be sketching a little bit later, which is that when you've put down all of these data that I'm talking about here, um, the solutions become isolated rather than being continuously variable. And if one of them lands on a place with an additional symmetry, then it would be as you say. So, so, so they can indeed arise in that manner. Yes, thank you. Other, other questions? Keith. If we just think about string theory as you know, raw data, we're starting from the beginning and only imposing the minimum set of conditions needed for stability, yeah. uh, for self-consistency, then you would start with a four-dimensional theory cross some internal theory that has constraints on it. Yeah. To what extent do those constraints require that, that six-dimensional theory, uh, even to call it six-dimensional, to have a geometric interpretation as a compactification? They do not. So you're talking about a class of theories Precisely. for which there are geometric compactifications, but there are other string theories that are completely outside this class, yes? You're, you're completely right. Okay. Yeah, what I'm describing to... here is a geometric part of the string landscape, the part in which the internal, uh, in which the part that's not three plus one dimensional is in fact a space. Uh, it could be a conformal field theory, for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right, and you know, in the fullness of time, we hope to understand those in roughly the same level as here. These ones, however, are a little easier to picture in certain respects. So yes, thank you. Other questions or corrections? <clears throat> okay, so um, now when you've done all this, um, the invariants that you need to keep track of to specify the solution amount to a finite number of integers. You should think, and I'll say a little bit more, this number is usually hundreds, maybe thousands of integers. But that's it. 
You don't have to say anything else. And so, OK, well, I mean, it's sort of fun to think, you know, long ago we, we learned that matter is quantized, and then Descartes proposed the corpuscular theory, which Newton also loved. Einstein formulated it for electromagnetism. Millikan showed he was right. We learned that force carriers are quantized. And now string theory is telling us actually the parameters are quantized too. There's really nothing continuously variable in there. However, OK, don't get the wrong idea. It's not that I'm saying that the dimensionless parameters are interesting rational numbers or something. Far from it. The measurable parameters, like the fine structure constant, are presumably solutions to absolutely horrendous transcendental problems. But these are transcendental problems that take finite integer inputs and then produce something observable. OK, so um, summary then, cosmologically viable quantum gravity theories in 3 plus 1 dimensions are specified by finitely many integers. And with regard to Keats' question, I think um, we, I would expect it would come out the same way if we were studying non-geometric ones too. They're still specified by finitely many fundamental integer parameters. So parameter vector in z to the n where n is 100 or 1,000. Now, not all of these points in this lattice are consistent or allowed by the theory itself. Also. Uh, to my mind, there's no compelling evidence for any infinite family of vacua of string theory, isolated vacua of string theory, with minimum scalar mass fixed above zero. All the infinite families I know of have the property that as you continue in the infinite family, eventually the minimum mass tends to zero in the limit, and those become unviable. For that reason, I'm going to assume the number of viable vacua is just finite. And this finite set of vacua is the string landscape. OK, with due apologies, I'm studying a particular piece of the string landscape. But if, this, if these parameters are understood broadly, this is what I mean, at least, by the string landscape. Well, and even if it were an extra-dimensional CFT, you, 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 wouldn't, you, would, you would still have a similar sort of data description, even if that data isn't necessarily a geometry. There would still be a most, most certainly. I, I would still yeah. expect to find a finite set of solutions specified by a collection of integers. That's correct. That's right. OK, any questions about this? OK, so how big is it? Well, it depends on where you're looking in, for example, type 2b compactifications on six manifolds called Calabia threefolds. The number that shows up is 100 to 500. That's a typical number of three cycles and two and four cycles. For example, we'll run into the number 491 a lot later on. Um, and the number of vacua, as estimated by Deniff and Douglas, uh, is, uh, say, 10 to the 500 in this, in this region. Now, uh, in F theory and Calabia fourfolds, Wadi has argued that um, you might be able to find some number like this, 10 to the 272,000 vacua, because the number of cycles is bigger. It's up to 1.8 million, roughly. So these are large, discrete sets that we'd like to explore. And our goal is to connect these solutions to the observed universe. And if we want to do that, what we need to know is what values can the parameters take? They don't fill out all of z to the n, but they fill out some subspace or some subset of z to the n. And if I give you an allowed set of values, what would be observed in the resulting universe? Okay, and by observations, I just mean pretty broad stuff like, you know, what kinds of matter fields are there? How many generations of quarks and leptons are there? What's the gauge group? What's the vacuum energy? What does the dark sector look like? What are the masses and couplings of dark sector particles? Okay. And so we can conceive of this as a map from parameters to observables, where the parameters are all the values of n integers that are allowed by the theory. N is the number of parameters, so you know, think of it as 1,000. And the observations are some finite precision. Well, you could think of them as real numbers if you want, but of course we only measure stuff to a finite number of decimal places in experiments. The observations are the possible values of some measurable parameters. So like the things that go in the particle data book, the list of all the numbers we've figured out from all the particle experiments to date. This map is too hard. And so we always have an intermediary step where we convert from parameters to uh, uh, fundamental parameters to the data of a quantum field theory, and then from there to observations. And what I mean by the data of a quantum field theory, well, it has lots, but the part that we need to think about now is includes the data of a Riemannian manifold called the field space with some metric, and a function from the field space to the reals, which is the potential. This is the measure of the energy density of the system if the fields find themselves at a particular point in the field space. And now the vacuo we're going to think about are the local minima of this potential. So some of these red dots are, are maxima, but inside you can see some minima too. Local minima, so the gradient zero and the Hessian matrix of double derivatives is a positive matrix. Sorry, when you say field space, that's space of fields? Correct. This so is this, you're talking about an infinite dimensional manifold. Uh, no, this is the space um, whose 
local coordinates are the finite number of fields in the theory. So for example, if you had a theory of five real scalars, then the, con the field space would just be a five manifold, a Riemannian five manifold. The number of possible configurations is infinite, but what we're, what, thank you, what we're talking about here are situations in which um, the, f the fields are not, right now, non-trivial functions of space, three space. So we're imagining, rather than phi of x, y, z, t, which would indeed be infinite dimensional, when we're considering that everywhere in space and time, there's one value of phi. So that reduces the problem to simply being coordinatized by points on a manifold whose dimensionality is the number of scalar fields. Uh, that seems like a rather large uh, simplification to assume that all the fields it, are it's a single, It is a large simplification. For many things, we have to do better. But for example, right now, you know, the Higgs has a VEB. It has a vacuum expectation value, and we can describe things by that. As far as we know, the, in the theory of inflation, for example, we start out with a, with a field space let's say a one-dimensional field space, and that describes what we think of as the background evolution, the average behavior of the universe, and then you study fluctuations on top. Indeed, the fluctuations are infinite dimensional, but you first study the background. Okay. So for describing backgrounds, this is, what, this is what we do, and then we have to quantize the fluctuations on top, and then you have a quantum field theory with infinitely many degrees of freedom. Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay, so now let's come to the question of dark energy. So one observable, Okay, in the late 90s, people figured out that the energy density of empty space is about 10 to the minus 26 kilogram per cubic meter rather than zero, which is what had been anticipated. And so that makes up most of the energy density in the universe now, with atoms a tiny fraction. And string theory does not have a continuous parameter that you can dial to match this observation. Note that this, is, this number, if written in Planck units, is a really small number. So it seems like a weird thing. You know, in a quantum gravity theory, you would expect that most things you compute come out order one in Planck units, or maybe order 10 or something, but not some very small number. So this is a strange thing for a quantum field theory to predict. Yes, please. What about the dilaton? Can't I dial that continuously? Well, that's a VEV, but there's not a parameter. So what you need to do is find an isolated solution in which the dilaton VEV is as large as you want. Because if, if the dilaton VEV can be dialed continuously, then you're ruled out by all of the moduli problems. Once you add a for example, fluxes that give a potential to the dilaton that has finitely many possible allowed positions. At each of those, you know, things change. And the question is, is there one that's good? Yeah. So, so you're saying you've got to fix the dilaton? Uh, oh, for sure. In, in some yeah, way. yeah. But if you then, don't, you're dead. Yeah. If the dilaton was something related to dark energy, then it might be part of a quintessence thing. And then it wouldn't be... Yeah, so an alternative possibility is that there's a, a runaway. Uh, as, as you know, the problems for describing that are, are even harder. Um, and so there's, there's a, I think, a, a thin hope held by some that there's an alternative explanation other than the one I'm providing. <coughs> Correct. Um, so, but even so, that wouldn't be a parameter. That would be a field. You'd have to be buying into there being a way around the moduli problem, and then you adjust the VEV of the field. Now, since you can't adjust that, the only remaining hope would seem to be that if string theory does have vacua, which predict lots of different values, each vacuum predicts its own value of the vacuum energy, which range from, say, minus m Planck to the fourth to m Planck to the fourth. So that's pictured here. Here's energy, and here's a collection of vacua with different values of the energy density. Let's say here's the observed one, and here's zero. Well, if the theory produces considerably more than 10 to the 120 vacua, and the distribution is uniform enough, you should not be surprised to find some that are within the observational allowed region. Okay, this is just saying you, you're, you should be surprised, however, if I told you that string theory has no fundamental parameters that can be adjusted, and the number of vacua of string theory is only 10 to the 20, then you would expect that this problem cannot be accommodated. There's no reason for string theory to be able to be compatible with measurements of dark energy. Um, so this is called the anthropic solution to the cosmological constant problem. It's not really a solution to the problem, but it's at least an accommodation. Any theory that has no adjustable parameters and many fewer than this many vacua has a very serious problem to face. OK, so this is an example of the kind of thing that you can try and solve by counting solutions, by counting topological things. And that's something that. Um, I'll, I'll try and describe in the remainder. So um, now, having gone through the <coughs> kind of problem we face, let me try and make it concrete uh, in a particular 
case of toric hypersurfaces. So this is now work, um, some of which I've been doing. This is with Cody Long, who's here, and my current students, Mehmet Demirtas and Andres Reyes Tascon, and uh, my colleague, a mathematician, Mike Stillman at Cornell. Um, so finding Ritchie flat six manifolds in the wild is super hard. Um, in the case of Calabiao threefold hypersurface, a special category of them, the problem is combinatorial and is very easy to automate. Uh, so a toric variety, this is the arena we'll be working in, a toric variety is an algebraic variety that you can make out of simple pieces. You can glue together copies of algebraic tori. So C star is the complex plane, omit the origin. And N here is going to range from 0 to 4. When N is 0, C star to the 0, I'll call that a point. So we're taking a point, C star, C star squared, up to C star to the fourth. And all I'm going to do is glue those pieces together according to instructions encoded in a lattice polytope. The polytope here is just the convex hull of a set of lattice points. And there's a vast class of toric varieties that are encoded in four-dimensional polytopes that have a certain property called reflexive, which means that the only interior lattice point is the origin, both for the polytope and for its dual. Basically, we're going to think about certain nice polytopes in Z to the fourth. And those give us instructions for assembling eight manifolds. Complex, four complex dimensional, real eight dimensional manifolds. Now, four dimensional reflexive polytopes have been classified. You can classify yourself the two dimensional ones. There are just 16. And then Kreutzer and Skarka classified all 473,800,776 four dimensional reflexive polytopes. They enumerated them. They didn't just prove that this number exists, but they, they figured them all out and they listed them on their website. Um, and each sufficiently nice, so, okay, so here come some, some phrases which I'll explain in the following slide. Each fine regular star triangulation of such a polytope gives the instructions to make a toric variety <coughs> inside of which lives a smooth Calabia threefold. Okay, and so what's a, what's a triangulation? It's a subdivision of a polytope into simplices. So here's a triangulation of a square. Here's the other triangulation of the square. And these other words, uh, fine means it just uses all the points. Star means that all the simplices contain the origin, and regular means it descends from a construction one dimension higher. But basically what you should think of in this statement is each sufficiently nice triangulation of one of these finitely many nice polytopes yields a Calabia threefold. So we have a finite set of instructions for assembling the data of Calabia threefolds, and we'd like to understand what observables we can get from this. And this is a, a fruitful way of going because we've reduced an analysis problem solving a second order PDE the mangin pair equation that tells you that the Ritchie tensor vanishes, which is basically hopeless, to in, instead of solving PDEs, well, next step would be to solve polynomial equations. For us, that's still too hard, but then we can reduce it to integer manipulations, which we start to get some traction. Um, but at each step, do you lose something? In other words, uh, uh, you have all the solutions. You're certainly not finding all the Ritchie flat eight manifolds. Very interesting. So within this category, um, we we can find all of them by the combinatorial operation. Up here, I, I think a very interesting question to which I, I don't know the answer, and I, I'm pretty sure the answer is not known, is the following. Are there any Ritchie flat six manifolds that are compact that don't have reduced holonomy? In which the holonomy is SO6. So we're always using the same kind of tricks, special holonomy, SU3 holonomy, and then you can usually map that to something in algebraic geometry, and then in some cases in toric hypersurfaces, you can reduce it to combinatorics. We do know we lose something in the restriction to this particular toric variety case. However, as I'll sketch at the end, you might imagine, we sometimes dream that this corner that we're looking at does still have most of the vacua. I think that's plausible, although it's not established. But in this first case, are we losing anything in going to an algebraic description from an analytic one? I have no idea. Um, it, it, it could be that there's infinitely many Ritchie flat six manifolds with holonomy SO6 that can't be found by any of these constructions. But I've never heard a hint of them either. Is there any physical reason that special holonomy uh, would uh, come up? Or is it just? Supersymmetry. Oh, OK. Yeah, so special holonomy gives you supersymmetry and um, if we were bought into having supersymmetric solutions of the theory, which are awfully nice, then we're actually already okay studying these ones with special holonomy. Yeah. But the plain equations of motion just say the Ritchie tensor <coughs> vanishes. So are there non-trivial solutions? Very interesting question. I don't know. Okay, so um, let me just give you an example of the discrete parameters just to one time list out the stuff you would choose. And apologies for the experts. I'm slightly simplifying some of the, some of the terms, but just in it, in interest of being concrete. So what do you do? You want to make a vacuum. You pick a polytope. 
there's 473 million, pick one, choose a triangulation of it that determines a hypersurface X in V. And now you choose quantized fluxes, which means you choose some vectors in H3 of Xz, which is Z to the 2, H21 of X. This is one of the Hodge numbers of X, so you should think of this as a couple hundred. And then, among other things, you might think of choosing, with apologies to the F, there's choosing D7 brain configurations by choosing to wrap D7 brains on various four cycles in this manifold. And the, that amounts to the choice of a collection of vectors, A ranges from one up to however many D7 brains you want, a collection of vectors in H4 of Xz, which again is Z to the some hundreds or something. And then for each D brain, you have to choose a bundle, so you have to specify a quantized two form on that too. And there's more besides, but this is the kind of stuff you have to pick. So you throw down those choices of integers, and then that allows you, in principle, to compute the potential. Yes? Is there any hope or any interest in choosing all these things uniformly at random? Yes. Yes, we would love to. Yeah, in fact, I'll, I'll comment on that in a minute. Um, you might say, um, let me get back to that when I discuss why you would try and count things. We would very much like as a null hypothesis to be able to do exactly that, to sample them randomly from the set of allowed values. Yes. So uh, yeah, in a couple of minutes, I'll return to that at some depth. OK, so then the task that, that we face, um, the computational task, OK, you've got to triangulate a polytope, look at a triangulation to compute some intersection numbers. And how many points do these polytopes have? Well, if you look in Kreutzer and Skarka's list, the number of points is the Hodge number H11 plus 4. And the number of intersection numbers of divisor, triple intersections of divisors in a threefold is you know, H11 cubed, approximately. And in fact, H11 only goes up to 491. So it doesn't even sound that hard, because we're only talking about triangulations of a set of at most 495 points. So surely this is easy, right? Well, sort of. Uh, you can make it easy to find one such triangulation. The trouble is, uh, first of all, most triangulations that you can easily find are not going to be fine, regular, and star. If you just throw down a triangulation, it often won't be that. But even that can be solved. You can efficiently find these triangulations. Trouble is, how many are there? So here's the arena where we're looking. This is the famous shield plot. This axis is H21, the number of three cycles in X. This is H11, the number of four cycles in X. Many of you have worked on this, many others as well. Each point here is a Hodge pair, H11, H21. There's only 30,000 of them. There are many more polytopes, so many polytopes have the same Hodge numbers. But still, there's only finitely many polytopes, and they're all represented here. Here's the hardest one. H11 is 491. That's the one with 495 points. Still, it does not sound too hard. So how many triangulations do these things have? Well, we don't know. But uh, we can put a bound, unfortunately an upper bound, um, that's combinatorially big. So we, we've shown, this is work with my students Demirtis and Rias Tascon, the number of fine regular star triangulations is bounded above by this binomial coefficient. V is the volume of the polytope. It's some lattice polytope in 4D, so just compute its volume. Right? And um, choose H11 plus 3. And here's a plot of it. So these are all of the points, all of the polytopes in the kreutzer skarka list with H11 from 250 to 491. And here is log base 10 of the number of, uh, the number of triangulations according to this bound. And you see it goes up to 10 to the 900. Um, the, the winner up here, the biggest one, H11 of 491, is 10 to the 928. And the runner up is 65 orders of magnitude below. And now to this question about uniformity, we begin to see, in some cases, some parts of the system may so dominate combinatorially that you might want to sample there. Yes, buddy. Yeah, sorry, quick question, Liam. Do you have any sense of how the number of different sets of triple intersection numbers is scaling with the number of triangulations? Would love to know. We're, we're, we're going to be working on it, but we don't even have a preliminary result in that direction. Is it uh, possible that some of these uh, fine regular star triangulations give rise to the same uh, yes. threefold at the end? So you yes. might be like overcounting? We might be vastly overcounting. There, this bound, okay, yeah, thank you. Let me remark, first of all, even without that, we are definitely overcounting because we know some constraints that we have not put into this bound. So this is, this is definitely a bound, but I'm certain that the, number, the actual number lies a bit below this, at least. Now, could there be a gigantic reduction via uh, different effort, apparently different FRSTs giving equivalent physics? Yes. Um, to me, that still seems pretty hard to handle at these large Hodge numbers. Um, People in this room did a lot of work to achieve this at H11 up to 6, and it, it seemed hard there. Um, I'm hoping that in the next couple of years we'll get a handle on that, but we don't have any handle on it right now. 
Yeah. yeah, also like for take pick a couple of examples for fixed Hodge numbers, right? You'll have a lot of spread. There's a lot of structure in I mean beyond Plans. the beyond the upper bound. Pardon me? Beyond the upper this is the upper bound that you're plotting, right? To yes, some extent. Yes. Like if you look at the actual triangulations for e for a particular polytope, yeah. um, that might not saturate it. And then there are lots of like, you know, distributions and so on that you can look at for, for various ones that Right. In in other words, to try and to look at one of these and see how many degeneracies does one see, and so how far below this does the real thing lie, right? Yes. Yeah, that, I think that's something we'd very much like to do. We're in a certain sense involved in it. And so the mean value might be completely so, for example. Oh, uh, the, the mean, the, first of all, the mean value may not be peaked at the largest H11, and it may be peaked much lower, and um, it could be, you know, 800 orders of magnitude below this. Yes, definitely possible. Um, but this gives a sense, and now we'll get to this in a minute, the, of the targets we sort of face. We'd like to figure out in a system like this what really are the actual number uh, of triangulations that show up. Right? OK, so, so why do we want to count solutions? Coming back to this question of why, why would you want to sample things? Um, Sorry, can I ask yes, a uh, follow-up question? So have you, uh, has there been any work that computed these numbers for small H11s and yes. see how it yeah. looks like? So, so, um, Yes, uh, people here, uh, Brent for sure, and Vishnu was involved in this too, right? And Jan was involved in some of this, I think. Um, um, in, in various collaborations have rather systematically figured out everything up to H11 of six or so. And that's the place where even if you're pretty clever with modifying things like Sage and other existing packages, it still gets sort of hard. We came up, after a while of working on it, we came up with some methods that allow us to now um, easily go all the way up to here very, very quickly. Um, however, the thing that they were able to do down there, um, at H11 up to 6, was fundamentally, in principle, achievable because the number of triangulation ones was you know, less than 10 to the 12. So you could imagine doing it. Up here, um, I, I am not sure how much you can envision really doing. If it turns out that you can prove a lower bound also, and that's an unsampleably large number, then, then we'd be in trouble. So does the trend, given that by the plot that you showed, uh, not this one, but uh, this yes. one. Is that reasonable? As in, like, if you, I mean, I guess up to six, you can maybe say you can't see really any pattern uh, for H11 less than six, but. Yeah, yeah. Extrapolating from the small H11 results to here is pretty challenging. I'm a big fan of trying to do that because what you might try and do is use one over H11 as the small parameter in your model and build, for example, a random matrix model or something where where n is h11 and you expand in 1 over n. I would love to do that. I've written a bunch of papers trying, but it's a little hard until you also have a little bit richer data up here to calibrate. And so that's one of the things that we're driving at is sampling here well enough, not just getting like a bound which could be way off, as many of you have, have easily recognized, um, get enough data here that you can calibrate such a model. Just to help me follow the discussion, I hear talk about h116, and then your chart starts, the smallest number is 250. Yeah. But what's going on? Right, uh, so they weren't, they weren't worth looking at at the small values for this present purpose. So H11 goes up from 1, the quintic, or any, the sim first non-trivial one is 2, up to 491. Okay. Okay, and the thing is, the number of points in the polytope is H11 plus 5, plus 4, rather. And so um, these are just the richer and more complicated polytopes with more triangulations. So all I was doing is giving, so this formula holds for any H11, but it's, interesting to look at when the numbers are very large, and these dominate in the counting. So to the question of uniformly sampling, if I were to sample all triangulations of polytopes in the Kreutzer-Skarka list, a reasonable guess, given present information, with caveats that I've already mentioned, a reasonable guess is that almost all of them are in fact triangulations of this biggest polytope, which is why I've zeroed in on this large H11 regime. Okay. Now that would actually be simplifying and clarifying in a nice way. It would mean you only have to study one polytope. And to be honest, it's a pretty nice polytope. I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Um, right, so let me, let me, let me cut through. Um, this, this is just to say, if you study a lot of solutions and you find that almost all of them have some property, then you might take that as a null hypothesis, the sort of natural prediction of the theory. Okay, but let's, let's um, just say it's reasonable Oh, well, if there's 10 minutes, then I can say two words about this. Um, so suppose string theory has some large finite number of solutions that fulfill some gross criteria, like having the standard model or something like that. Then if an overwhelming fraction of those solutions have some other property, like say they have two kinds of dark matter, not one, then I would say you should view that, without any other information, you should view that as 
the prediction of your theory. That's a null hypothesis that you should be trying to study. And this comes back now to the question about uniform sampling. This counting measure prediction excludes selection effects. It excludes the possibility that maybe some of these solutions cause universes that recollapse quickly and others don't. That's all left out. All I'm attempting to do is to say the set of possible quantum gravity theories per these rules is finite but large. And all we want to do is count occurrences of various <coughs> properties in that finite set without regard to selection effects that favor one over another. Okay. Now, if that's what you're doing, then it's reasonable to focus on the place where all the numbers are. And most of the numbers here are in the complicated polytopes with big H11. Okay, this is also effectively what Wadi was uh, emphasizing in the case of F theory, where if there's one geometry that has 10 to the 272,000 vacua and that dominates over everything else, you might as well just study that one geometry and forget about all the rest. It, yes. Yes. So fluxes sort of push you to large H21. Yeah. Triangulations push you to large H11. Do you think right. maybe we're actually at that little point in the middle? <laughs> I know, I know. 251, 251, or yeah. whatever. That would be very nice. I don't know. Um, the trouble is, I don't know how to account for the degeneracies in these overcounts. Yeah, like maybe there are a lot of the same triple intersection. Right. And one interesting question is if you write out all the things you get to choose, so back where I was saying, you know, what, um, what you get to pick, an, it's interesting to ask in one regime of string theory, one of these islands, um, if you multiply through all the number of choices you get at each point, which number dominates, right? And you're saying maybe the, you know, the fluxes and the triangulation choices sort of match. That, that could well be in some corners. Could be that there are other corners where it's either the triangulations or the fluxes that dominate. Yeah, I'd very much like to know the answer to that. Okay, so um, this, is the, this polytope, you know, it sounds like, oh, it's the end point of this thing. It's so complicated. It's not, actually. So the columns here are the points in z to the 4 where its vertices lie. It has five vertices in z to the 4, and it's a simplex. So it just has like triangular faces. It's a very, very simple space. And here's its biggest face triangulated. I mean, it's sort of a weird patterned triangulation, but you know, that, that's all we're looking at. We're looking at triangulations of objects like this. OK, so, so now let's um, try and connect this to things we might try and do with machine learning. So this is the target, I think, for machine learning. Um, I've carefully pruned away continuous families of solutions that are not cosmologically viable, solutions where the internal spaces are non-geometric, where we don't yet know how to uh, set all of the knobs correctly, and that zeroes us in on this space, the Kreutzer-Skarka list, where we think we do know how to describe the fundamental parameters in terms of some integers that you can choose. And the question is just, what are the values of those integers? And when you make a choice, what do you get? So one thing you might try and do is account vacua. Um, you might like to estimate or bound the number of triangulations of a polytope when this number is so large that it's impossible to do a direct enumeration. We talked about that a bit already. Another thing you might try and do, uh, I'm particularly interested in doing, is finding desirable vacua. So based on physics reasoning, you figure out some desired feature, say something that gives an interesting inflationary cosmology, something with a bright polarization signature in the cosmic microwave background, or, or something that would be excluded by current dark matter searches, or whatever you like. Um, so concretely, something that, would give, that could give a bright primordial gravitational wave signal is a situation in which the largest eigenvalue of the metric on the field space is bigger than some threshold value. So the target is find a triangulation in which the metric on field space is bigger than some has top eigenvalue bigger than some given number. Now, um, I think this is an interesting kind of problem because the space that we'd like to explore is an extremely large discrete set. There are some correlations in it, but we don't know right now what those correlations are. And so we'd like to somehow find places that optimize this property uh, without checking them all. <clears throat> you might also just ask a more intrinsically topological question, like find a triangulation with a particular pattern of intersection numbers. Right? <coughs> and what I mean by with a feature, you could say, I want to find a triangulation that definitely has some property. Um, it seems to me it might be easier to find sort of a concentration of interesting results. To, in other words, to have some machine learning algorithm produce a collection of triangulations that are worth testing because their probability of having a desired feature is vastly increased compared to the median probability on the, in the ensemble, even though there are no guarantees. This is not that hard because most of the features that at least I care about, uh, we can verify in seconds. So it's not that bad um, if you just do a, a guess and check, as long as it's an inspired guess. 
Um, and finally, it would be really nice if you could make predictions straight from the polytopes and not triangulate in the meantime. For example, given a polytope, predict some features that hold for all of its triangulations or that hold for all triangulations in some new subclass that you pick out. And this would be a huge simplification. Surely this is not the right number, but anyway, it's some gigantic number. Um, this would be much simpler because, honestly, studying a couple of triangulations of every polytope in the kreutzer skarka list is something we could do in you know, a year at most. Um, but studying the full space of triangulations is uh, unmanageable at this point. OK, so to summarize the task, we face a finite but extremely large set, which is the Kalabiyev threefold hypersurface in toric variety subset of the string landscape. And we want to evaluate various fitness functions on this discrete set, and we want to find local and global maxima. It takes us milliseconds to seconds per evaluation, so we can explore it, but we need some help figuring out where to look. There, there are tons of correlations in the data, but it's just hopeless to try and find all of them by, by human intelligence. And it would be great if we could get some um, help exploiting these patterns and finding them via machine learning. And then setting this aside, just this particular corner that I focused on, I should stress there's an immense array of very closely related problems here and in other regions of the landscape, and it'd be great to get input on how to solve those too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liam. There were already quite some questions, but we have time for one or two more. I don't have any uh, real intuition for how superposition works when you're superimposing universes. Uh, but is it uh, possible that we shouldn't be looking for a particular vacuum, but that we're in some superposition of them? I have not found yet a, a manageable superposition question here, just because the, um, you know, the sizes of the systems are so big, you would expect there to be tremendous decoherence effects. But I, 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 I don't know how to think about that problem, to, to be honest. Maybe I think Mike does. Perhaps. Well, I mean, this is a regime where, indeed, we, we justify all these calculations by saying that the extra dimensions are, are big enough that we can use these geometric considerations. And then they don't superpose. There's a big. Now, there could be some other non-geometric regime where the solutions are small. And then you know, it really would be some other basis in which this is, uh, yeah, this is the basis and then the real solutions are superpositions, but it's not a regime we have access to now. Okay. <coughs> All right, then I'd just say we um, break for coffee, <coughs> meet again at 10.15 and if you're speaking next and haven't sent us the slides, please do so, so we can make a smooth transition between the short talks. Thank you.